Welcome to my video series, Essential Extract Complex Analysis. Since this is the first video in the series, I'd like to take a minute at the beginning to explain what the goal is and who these videos are aimed at. First of all, the goal of this series is to give a broad overview of most of the major topics that you would learn in an undergraduate or even a graduate level complex analysis course. The topics that I'm planning on covering are listed here. I'm not going to read them out, but as you can see, it's a pretty extensive list. In addition, because I like a challenge, I'm going to try to go through all of these topics in under two hours. In other words, I'm going to try to keep the sum of the lengths of all of the videos in this series to less than two hours. That's part of the reason why this series is called the Essential Extract of Complex Analysis. I am going to give some examples and even some proofs along the way, and I'll try to present everything coherently and in a way that you can remember. However, I'm not going to stop and dwell on any of the topics for too long. So having said that, who would benefit most from watching these videos? Well, I would say that there are a few categories of people, and here are some that I can think of. Number one is people who are just beginning a course in complex analysis. People who are in this category might want to try to look ahead to see what to expect down the line and what some of the goals of the course might be. I think it's always a good idea at the beginning of a course to do this. That way you can understand why your instructor is steering the lectures in various directions. Number two is people who are at the end of a course in complex analysis. For example, maybe you're about to take an exam in complex analysis. Well, if you want to have a quick top level review of a lot of the major topics, then these videos should help with that. Number three is people who've already learned the subject but need a quick refresher. This is actually one of the original reasons why I thought to make this particular series of videos. Usually when I teach analytic number theory, which is a graduate level math course that relies heavily on complex analysis, there are a lot of students who don't remember the fundamentals, and I also usually don't have enough lecture time to go back and fill them in. Number four is sort of similar to number three. This is people who are already really uh, relatively good at math and want to quickly learn complex analysis in order to apply it to something else. That something else could be another subject within math or maybe some sort of engineering or physics problem that you're working on. Anyway, maybe this is you, in which case you get the idea. After I wrote this list down, I thought of a fifth category of people that maybe should be listed here. That is people who are curious and interested in seeing some really beautiful mathematics. Uh, not that the mathematics that I personally produce is really beautiful, but complex analysis itself is really one of the most elegant branches of mathematics. Okay, now having said all of that, I think we'd better go ahead and start on the content, otherwise the two-hour challenge mark is going to slip out of reach. One last thing, as I'm going through all of these topics, if there's anything that you'd like to see explained in more detail, just leave me a comment and I'll try to address it, either by replying or possibly in a separate video. All right, now let's go ahead and get started. In this first video, I'm going to talk about complex numbers. The two main topics that I'm going to explain are arithmetic with complex numbers and geometric representations of complex numbers. Now, this may seem really basic to some of you, and it is, but really it's the foundation for what I'm going to talk about next. If there are some of you who are already really good at complex numbers, you could either fast forward through this video or even skip to the next video. First of all, here's something that hopefully all of us are familiar with, and that is the set of complex numbers. As indicated here, the complex numbers are things of the form z equals x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers. The quantity i, of course, is the square root of negative 1, and the main thing that you need to know about it is that when you square it, you get negative 1. Given a complex number of this form, the number x is called the real part of z, and the number y is called the imaginary part of z. The set of all complex numbers is denoted by the symbol blackboard c, as I've written here. Now for some basic definitions, let's suppose that you have two complex numbers, z equals x plus i y and w equals u plus i v. How do you add and multiply them together? Well, first of all, the sum z plus w is defined to be the new complex number whose real part is the sum of the real parts of z and w and whose imaginary part is the sum of the imaginary parts of z and w. The product of z times w is just what you get by expanding out the product of x plus i y times u plus i v using the distributive law together with the fact that i squared is equal to negative 1. One thing that's worth mentioning at this point is that the set of complex numbers together with addition and multiplication form what's called a field. That just means that addition and multiplication are associative and commutative, that they satisfy a distributive law, that every number has an additive inverse, which is its negative, and that every non-zero number has a multiplicative inverse, which I'll show you how to find in just a minute. A couple more important definitions before I move on. 
The complex conjugate of the number z that I've defined here is defined to be x minus i y, and it's denoted by z with a bar over it. The modulus of the number z is defined to be the square root of x squared plus y squared, and this is just a measurement of how large the complex number z is. Okay, now I'm going to go through some basic facts. If you want to prove that you're ready to go further, then you need to be able to verify all of these basic facts on your own. The first basic fact is that if you take a complex number and you add its complex conjugate, you just get two times the real part of the number. This follows directly from the definitions that I showed you on the previous slide. If you know how to do that one, then you're likely going to see this one right away. When you take a complex number and you subtract its complex conjugate, you get 2i times the imaginary part of the number. This one is maybe slightly less obvious, although I think a lot of you have probably seen this before. If you take the modulus of a complex number and you square it, you get the same thing as if you multiply the complex number times its complex conjugate. If this is not 100% obvious to you, you can just write down what the right-hand side is in terms of x's and y's and expand it out, and you should get x squared plus y squared, which is equivalent to what's on the left-hand side. Finally, if z is not 0, then the modulus of z is not 0, and you can just rearrange the third fact here to get a formula for the inverse of z. The inverse of z is equal to the complex conjugate of z divided by the modulus of z squared. Next, I want to talk about a geometric way of representing complex numbers. First of all, we represent a complex number z with real part x and imaginary part y by the point x comma y in the Cartesian plane. Here, what we would usually call the x and y axes of the Cartesian plane are called the real and imaginary axes. This geometric realization of the set of all complex numbers is called the complex plane. It's also very useful to talk about the polar representation of complex numbers in the complex plane. Let's write the point x, y as r theta in polar coordinates, where r, as usual, is the distance of x, y from the origin, and theta is the angle that the position vector of x, y makes with the positive real axis. It's easy, then, to see that r and theta are related to x and y by the equations r equals modulus of z, x equals r cosine theta, and y equals r sine theta. If I substitute these values of x and y back into the definition of z, then I get that z is equal to r cosine theta plus i times r sine theta. And when I factor out the r, I get z equals r times e to the i theta. Of course, you'll probably recognize that in the last step of this derivation, I'm using Euler's formula, which is the very important formula, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. Finally, I want to talk about geometric versions of the arithmetic operations. So what happens geometrically in the complex plane when you add or multiply two complex numbers together? Well, first of all, when you add two complex numbers, z equals x plus i y and w equals u plus i v, the complex number that you get following the law of addition is the diagonal of the parallelogram determined by the position vectors of z and w. In other words, geometrically, what you get when you add two complex numbers is determined by the parallelogram law for vector addition in Euclidean space. How about multiplication? Well, to understand geometrically what multiplication is doing, it's better to write the numbers z and w in polar coordinates. z equals r1 times e to the i theta 1, and w equals r2 times e to the i theta 2. When you do that, it's clear that when you multiply these two numbers together, what you get is just r1 times r2 times e to the power i times theta1 plus theta2. As I mentioned before, the numbers r1, r2, and r1, r2 are the moduli of the respective complex numbers. The angles theta1, theta2, and theta1 plus theta2 are called the arguments of the complex numbers. I've tried to illustrate for you here what happens when you multiply two complex numbers, z and w, together. And the important thing to realize about that is that the arguments theta1 and theta2 add together and the moduli multiply. Well, that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. In my next video, I'm going to talk about functions of a complex variable. When that video is posted, I'll put a link to it below. If you want to see more videos like this, please like and subscribe to my channel.